In 1995, a small meteor lands on the Earth. This seemingly insignificant meteor brought with it the most important resource humanity had ever seen, Tiberium. Leaching valuable minerals from the soil, Tiberium spread across the planet at a rapid rate. The Brotherhood of Nod, led by their messiah and leader Cain, were the first to develop effective, reliable techniques to harvest and refine Tiberium, generating great wealth for the newly risen faction, one that sought to shake up the established world order. In response, the United Nations formed the Global Defense Initiative in order to maintain world peace and limit the unchecked proliferation of Tiberium. Both the Brotherhood and GDI would inevitably come into conflict with each other, igniting the First Tiberium War. Despite rigorous study of the compound, Tiberium was still largely an anomaly to scientists, with 1.5% of it being unidentifiable. However, it was quickly discovered that Tiberium was toxic to humans and animals, almost always resulting in death. The most common ailments affected the respiratory, reproductive, and immune systems. During the First Tiberium War, Tiberium-related deaths for humans had reached over 4 million, with livestock being over 11 million. Many of these ailments and deaths were attributed to the toxic spores that were emitted from the green crystals, as well as those that spewed forth from blossom trees. Blossom trees were the result of mutation between Tiberium and standard trees. This mutation extended to all of Earth's flora, and even some fauna. Of course, these mutations could affect humans as well. The mutation could be near instantaneous, with the human or other animal transforming into a mindless blob of flesh called the visceroid. This would be the result of prolonged exposure within a Tiberium field, or the victim of a Tiberium-based weapon, such as Nod's chemical sprayers. Mutation could also be induced via direct injections of Tiberium into a person's body. Nod scientists performed such experiments as part of Project Regenesis, an initiative with the goal of creating Tiberium super soldiers, and beyond that, the next generation of humans. The results of this project saw the creation of three Tiberium augmented soldiers, the Initiate, the Acolyte, and the Templar. The Initiates never really cut it as soldiers, due to their fragile bodies and weak cognitive functions. The Acolytes and Templars proved to be more successful, though this was largely thanks to their cybernetic enhancements. GDI caught onto the project, and their best commando, Nick Havoc Parker, ultimately put an end to it. However, the surviving research from the project would go on to be used in the development of Nod's world-altering missile and cyborgs during the Second Tiberium War. Tiberium infusion could be used to enhance Nod's own troops, though not to the level of super-soldier status. Outside Project Regenesis, there were humans who survived prolonged exposure to Tiberium, with the green crystals becoming a unique physical aspect of their bodies. Normal humans would often refer to these mutants as Shiners, the mutants would respond in kind by calling non-infected humans blunts. But for the mutants, surviving Tiberium exposure was seen as a curse, for despite continued research, there was no cure for their condition. Thus, they were fated to endure a slow death, or transformation into some other Tiberium life form. Despite the Global Defense Initiative's victory against the Brotherhood of Nod at the end of the First Tiberium War, these Tiberium-afflicted humans were largely ignored by the now-dominant GDI. The surviving elements of the Brotherhood provided no help to these mutants either, only using them for the splintered faction's own experiments. Cast out of society, these mutants formed tribes. Underground warriors and innocent victims, these mutant outcasts called themselves the Forgotten. As the years went by, and Tiberium continued to spread across the planet, the population of the Forgotten increased. Across abandoned cities and Tiberium-infested regions, the tribes of the Forgotten lived mostly reclusive lives. The leader was a venerable warrior named Trados. He had assumed responsibility for his people for many years, offering them acceptance, shelter, and community where once they had none. The Forgotten still interacted with non-infected humans, though not necessarily on peaceful terms. They would engage in raids and other terrorist activities as retribution for their plight, such incidents caused the Brotherhood to continue using the mutants for unknown experiments, 
even going as far as to raid mutant dwellings to acquire test subjects. GDI, on the other hand, eventually launched a full-scale effort to rescue the infected population. This effort had mixed results. While some mutants received help from GDI, others were ignored. One such example is noted in a news archive, which reported on an ion storm that struck a GDI evacuation center in Bogota, Colombia. The disaster killed over 30 people, 30 non-Tiberium infected humans that is. 20 mutants were reported missing after the storm. However, GDI made no attempts to search for them, a situation that Trados was quick to point out, saying, quote, If 20 GDI blunts were suddenly missing, GDI police would give the case priority status. 20 of my people are missing, and they blame the weather. This is Nod territory. My people have been kidnapped. GDI's callousness towards those of us infected by Tiberium is inhumane. Whilst the Forgotten had to contend with attacks on their settlements, the mutants were by no means defenseless, using a variety of weapon systems from both GDI's and Nod's arsenals. The Forgotten took shelter in a variety of abandoned civilian structures, though they tended to settle in hospitals or civilian armories. Civilian armories were popular, as they gave the mutants access to firearms. When it came to actual military structures, the Forgotten used the GDI barracks, war factories, power plants, and component towers, which could be upgraded with all three types of defense components, those being Vulcan guns, surface-to-air missiles, and rocket-propelled grenade. They even used GDI's defensive walls and gates. For Brotherhood structures, the Forgotten made use of the Hand of Nod, War Factory, Advanced Power Plant, Helipad, Laser Turret, Sam Turret, and even the Obelisk of Light. In addition, laser fences were used to contain Tiberium fiends, and Nod walls were used to protect mutant bases, along with sandbags. Other buildings included the Construction Yard, Tiberium Refinery, Silos, Searchlight Towers, and Bunkers. The Bunkers acting as machine gun turrets. For vehicles, the Forgotten made use of a variety of armored civilian transports, including automobiles, buses, and recreational vehicles. Buses acted as the Forgotten's tanks, being armed with a cannon similar to the one equipped on Nod's Tick Tanks or GDI's Titan Mechwalkers. Automobiles acted as light attack vehicles, with the occupants firing their light arms weapons out the windows. Mutants armed with rocket launchers would ride in RVs, using them as anti-armor vehicles, similar to GDI's Hover MLRS. Speaking of GDI vehicles, the Forgotten primarily used the Wolverine for anti-infantry operations. While these Wolverines may have been captured by the Forgotten, it's also possible that some were given to the mutants by GDI, as a way of fostering better relations between the two factions. By far the most powerful armored vehicle in the Forgotten's arsenal was the Mammoth Tank, specifically the Mark I version used during the First Tiberium War. Since GDI had decided to replace much of their wheeled and tracked vehicles with mechanized walkers, like the Titan and Mammoth Mark II, many Mark I mammoths were either left abandoned at old GDI bases or kept in storage. These mammoths would be captured by the Forgotten, or like the Wolverines, were directly provided to the mutants by GDI. One very interesting quirk to note about the Mammoth tank was that it could cross the veins of a veinhole monster without agitating the creature. The same could not be said for captured Nod attack cycles in the Forgotten's arsenal, even though they would have been far lighter in weight compared to the Mammoth. Besides the attack cycles, the Forgotten also used Nod attack buggies, artillery, and harpies. Of course, for Tiberium harvesting, they used the standard harvester. As for their infantry, the Mutant, the Mutant Soldier, and the Mutant Sergeant were the Forgotten's equivalent to GDI's and Nod's own light infantry units. Mutants were male infantry armed with dual machine pistols. Soldiers were females armed with a rifle, and were often depicted with long hair styled in a ponytail. Sergeants were male mutants that led the other two infantry units in combat. They were also armed with dual machine pistols. While mutant infantry typically packed more firepower compared to their GDI and Nod counterparts, they had weaker armor, usually only wearing the clothes on their back, with custom scraps of armor layered on top. When killed, mutants would usually leave behind a cluster of Tiberium crystals. Though they wouldn't last as long in a fight, the Forgotten's infantry could heal any wounds they sustained within a Tiberium field. Whilst in a field, Forgotten units may encounter fiends, 
Large canine-like creatures, mutated by Tiberium, and highly aggressive to anyone that encroached on their territory. The Forgotten and Fiends seem to share a connection with each other, both being mutated by Tiberium. This aspect enabled the Forgotten to tame these creatures, and use them as guard hounds against anyone who would attack their homes. Fiends were quite vicious, launching shards of Tiberium at high speeds that would kill enemy infantry quickly, and even penetrate the armor of vehicles, destroying them. For dedicated anti-vehicle support, the mutants would typically arm themselves with the same shoulder-mounted rocket launchers used by Nod's own rocket infantry. Other more specialized Forgotten Infantry units included snipers, ghost stalkers, and hijackers. Using their suppressed rifles, snipers excelled at taking out enemy infantry, including Nod's cyborgs. Ghost stalkers were the commandos of the Forgotten. The Ghost Stalker was armed with a railgun that could blast through multiple infantry units in a row, and destroy most vehicles in one or two shots. He also carried C4 charges, used to demolish enemy structures. The Ghost Stalkers were so skilled in survival and combat that GDI would hire them to conduct operations in zones of heavy Tiberium infestation. Last were the Hijackers. As their name implies, Hijackers specialize in stealing enemy vehicles. This included crewed vehicles, too. After eliminating the crew, the hijacker would operate the stolen vehicle until it was destroyed. The hijacker was able to jump out of the vehicle just before its destruction, giving him the opportunity to take another nearby enemy vehicle, or run away. While GDI directly hired Ghost Stalkers, the Brotherhood of Nod was able to convince many mutant hijackers to work for them. By the year 2030, the Forgotten had grown to the point where they were recognized as a major faction alongside Nod and GDI. Despite this, they were not playable outside campaign missions, instead acting as a neutral or hostile faction across a few skirmish maps. The largest number of forgotten units can be found on the appropriately named map Knight of the Mutants. Across this map, squads of three or more mutants guard ramps or other crossroads that GDI or Nod units have to pass through. Plenty of fiends are located across the map too, either hidden in the Tiberium fields, or next to squads of mutants. In the middle of the map, on the east side of the river that runs through it, is a small village owned by the Forgotten. This village can be attacked, though the Forgotten will vigorously defend it. Across from this village, on the west side of the river, is a small church sitting on a hill, with several mutants standing around it. On the east side of the map, Storms, there is an abandoned armory next to what looks to be a Viceroid farm, or pen. Two mutants keep watch over the six Viceroids roaming around inside the pen, which is full of wrecks from both GDI and Nod vehicles. Any units that get too close to the pen will be attacked by the mutants inside. In the northeast corner of the map, Theme Park, there are several mutants behind a laser fence standing around a lake and field of blue Tiberium. Should this fence be destroyed, the mutants will run out on the battlefield and attack anyone they encounter. Additionally, in the northwest corner is a pack of fiends amongst a field of green Tiberium. In the southwest are a few Tiberium floaters, and opposite them in the southeast corner are some Viceroids. Lastly, on the Arctic map Nowhere to Run, there are two, mostly destroyed, villages in the central region of the map. Each of these villages contains several mutants living among the ruins. Any GDI or Nod units that pass through these villages will be attacked by the Forgotten Residents. Sometime before the start of the Second Tiberium War, Tratos desperately sought a cure for his people. To that end, he turned to the one artifact he thought could provide this cure, the Tacitus. The Tacitus was an ancient data matrix that contained a vast array of knowledge. It was extremely difficult to decipher, even for Tratos, who possessed a great intellect. It is not known exactly when or where the Tacitus was discovered, though it seems the artifact goes back thousands of years. It was perhaps discovered at an ancient site, similar to how one of the fragments of the Tacitus was later found inside a pyramid in Bolivia. Regardless, the Forgotten were the first to get a hold of the data matrix, and studied it in hopes of finding a cure. The Brotherhood of Nod approached Trados, offering to help him decipher the Tacitus using their newly created computer-assisted biologically augmented lifeform, Cabal. Trados agreed to the deal, however, he later realized he had been tricked, with the Tacitus falling completely into the hands of the Brotherhood, and most importantly, Cain. K 
Kane would imprison the mutant leader, and use the information Trados had deciphered to begin construction of a world-altering missile. A missile that would transform all carbon-based life on Earth to Tiberium-based life. Trados surrounded himself with a cadre of his finest warriors, one of which was Umagon. Umagon managed to evade capture by Nod, and sought to find a way to free the forgotten leader. However, the mutants in the region didn't have the resources to rescue Trotos, forcing Umagon to seek help elsewhere. One of Nod's commanders, General Vega, escaped from Sarajevo by flying an alien aircraft, which crashed at a site in New Mexico. GDI forces arrived and secured the crash site from the Brotherhood. GDI Commander Michael McNeil and a couple of his troops were searching the aircraft, looking for Vega, when they met Umagon. Bad for a blunt. You China. My name's Umagon and you better use it. Unless you want your head cut off. I don't. I can help you. I can help you find Vega. Vega? The Brotherhood holds our leader, Tratus, in a highly secured medical colony south of here. We don't have the resources to break him out without you. But you can't find Vega without us. Why should I trust you? Unlike you blunts, the Forgotten are a people of honor. In exchange for finding out the location of Vega, McNeil agreed to use his forces to help Umagon and the Forgotten free Tratos who was held at a prison camp in Mexico. Umagon, a ghost stalker, and a hijacker would infiltrate the camp and find the hospital where Tratos was imprisoned. Using a pack of fiends they found near the hospital, the Forgotten Squad fought their way into the building and freed Tratos. While GDI ground forces moved in and destroyed the Nod base, the mutants made their escape by way of an orca transport. Umagon and the Forgotten upheld their end of the bargain by giving McNeil information on the location of Vega's base, which GDI forces later assaulted. Though the deal between McNeil and Umagon was complete, the injuries Trato sustained while at the Nod prison camp would take time to heal, and the Kodiak was the best place to do so, providing medication and protection. Umagon and a few other Forgotten soldiers stayed with Tratos on the Kodiak until he made a full recovery. During his recovery, Trados had intense visions called Pentoses by the mutants. During one such Pentosi, Trados was, quote, plagued by visions of the death of the planet, an alien Armageddon that haunts his dreams. As the Second Tiberium War progressed, Nod developed chemical missiles, using them against targets in Europe and the Mediterranean. These missiles reformatted the Earth at the atomic level into pure toxic Tiberium. Umagon believed Nod could have only acquired the knowledge of such destructive weapons from the Tacitus. The Tacitus is nothing but a Shiner myth. We're gonna stop Kane, we have to shut down those missiles. Blunt. Mac. Many of my people are being experimented on at the Nod Cyberg plant south of Hamburg. If you will escort them to your evac center, they'll help you destroy the Nod supply base and the missile production center. First, rescue Hamburg. The Shiners can wait! And that is an order! Ultimately, McNeil rescued the forgotten prisoners located at a Nod base in Poland. A small GDI force led by Umagod would infiltrate the base perimeter, secretly making their way to the prison. Umagod found a ghost stalker and hijacker hiding out in a house in the region. They joined the strike force, made their way across a bridge, broke through the prison's defenses, and freed their forgotten brethren. An orca transport flew in and picked up the forgotten and surviving GDI troops. As thanks for rescuing them, the mutants would aid the GDI forces under McNeil's command. The mutants had information on a nearby Nod power station. Sir, get in the house. Those scary looking shiners. Kane's been using Tiberium to manipulate their DNA for cyber production. They say they had some information on an underground Nod power station that beat the Tiberium missile plant. Sir, they're here. ready to fight. Well, maybe we should give them a chance at a little payback. Suit them up, we'll go out to the supply base. And we'll find out what they really know about this power grid. With the help of the rescued Forgotten, McNeil and his GDI forces launched an assault on a chemical supply station, which manufactured and stored the toxins used in Nod's new chemical missiles. Near the supply station was a train depot that led to the Nod-owned power station. A ghost stalker captured the train, and after the chemical supply station was destroyed, GDI and Forgotten infantry units took the train to the power station. 
Sure you know where this train is headed? You sure you brought in a C4? There's enough explosives in the next car to blow us back in time. Just make sure you sink the stuff at all the power plants. No detonation until we get back above ground. Agreed? Agreed. The original plan was for the train to get past the gate and enter the Nod base. However, the Brotherhood garrison knew the Forgotten and GDI troops were on it. Nod destroyed the tracks just outside the base and set an ambush for the intruders. Despite being caught off guard, the Joint Strike Force made its way north, eliminating Nod defenders and destroying two of the six advanced power plants. Then, the group moved south and destroyed the four remaining plants. Detonate when ready, my friend. After their detour to destroy the power station, McNeil's Kodiak was attacked by a new type of Nod aircraft called the Banshee. Once they arrived in Hamburg, McNeil's forces, backed by the newly freed mutants, assaulted the chemical missile plant. Other mutants went out to contact those living in forgotten dwellings outside the region, encouraging them to join the fight on the side of GDI. With a consistent stream of forgotten reinforcements, GDI ultimately succeeded in leveling Nod's chemical missile plant. After the destruction of the missile plant, Tratos emphasized the importance of stopping Kane. However, General Solomon was more concerned with Nod's new Banshee aircraft than the information McNeil had learned from Tratos. Umagon decided to help GDI on this mission, but this time, it would be on her own terms. Ghost Stalker and I will take a squad of our own people in ahead. We know how to hide from them. They won't cloak the base if they don't know we're there. I think it's too dangerous. Let's get something straight. I don't take orders from you. I'm not fighting this war for you. I fight for the Forgotten. Umagon, Ghost Stalker, and a few other mutants entered the region where the prototype facility was located. They quickly found the practice range where the Banshees made flybys destroying captured mammoth tanks. After more scouting and eliminating of Nod patrols, the Forgotten Squad found the hidden Nod facility. Backed by their own prototype Mammoth Mark II Walker, GDI forces moved in and destroyed the production facility. Unfortunately, at some point during the battle, Umagon was captured by the Brotherhood. Kept personally under guard by Kane, Umagon was set to experience the process of divination. McNeil will come. He stopped your missiles, and he'll stop you. It's time you saw the future. While you still have human eyes. After surviving an attack by Nod forces in the middle of an ion storm, McNeil was contacted by Ghost Stalker, who told them of Umagon's capture and Kane's plan to launch a world-altering missile. McNeil and his forces immediately rolled out an assault against Kane's temple and launch facility in Cairo. Though outnumbered, the GDI attack force was able to destroy the Nod base, with McNeil rescuing Umagon and severely wounding Kane. Umagod was rushed to Trados, who had fully recovered and had created what he hoped was a cure for the Forgotten's Tiberium mutation. This serum appeared to work at the time, but later proved to be ineffective. No bad for want. During the alternative Brotherhood of Nod timeline of events in Tiberian Sun, the organization would use the Forgotten to bring Kane's plans to fruition. In this alternative timeline, the Brotherhood still gained control of the Tacitus, but Tratos evaded capture. The Tacitus was originally hailed at Sarajevo, but GDI activity in the area necessitated its retrieval. General Vega was able to secure the Tacitus and exfiltrate the area using the UFO. Just like in the GDI campaign, the UFO crashed with both Nod and GDI forces rushing to secure it. The leader of the Black Hand, Anton Slavik, was able to get an engineering team inside the crashed aircraft. However, Umagon snuck aboard the ship before them, retrieving the Tacitus and eliminating the Nod engineering team while making her escape. Cabal determined that Umagon would use the train stations at either New Detroit or Provo to escape the region. Slavic's forces moved in to destroy the trains and prevent her escape. While Slavic successfully captured Umagon, she did not have the Tacitus, having sent it off to Tratos. Umugan managed to escape her captors, unaware of the tracking device they had placed on her. Cabal tracked her to a mutant base where Tratos and the Tacitus were believed to be located. 
Kane ordered Slavic to capture the GDI base nearby and use the captured vehicles and equipment to attack the mutant base. Even with access to GDI's more advanced weapon systems, it was still a challenge for the disguised Nod forces to destroy the mutant dwelling. Once the Nod forces broke through the defenses and began targeting the forgotten civilian structures, Tratos surrendered, giving up the Tacitus to Nod. Thanks to Nod's propaganda, the rest of the forgotten population were convinced that GDI was responsible for the attack on the mutant camp. Good welcome, citizens. Battle grid response has reported that a GDI battalion rolled into an undefended mutant camp today, killing all but a few of the long-suffering forgotten who lived there. While their diplomats talk of finding a peaceful solution, it appears GDI's appetite for the blood of innocence continues to grow. The Brotherhood asks all citizens to join them, receive divination, and fight the great oppressor. GDI takes no responsibility for the attack that occurred earlier today. We consider the Forgotten to be our allies, and they must trust us when we say this was a Brotherhood trick. Never say trust us to a mutant. Kane grew concerned that GDI had developed a serum that could reverse Tiberium divination and ordered Slavic to destroy this research facility. A Nod informant was sent into a town near the research facility to make contact with the mutants residing among the ruins. The informant took out a GDI soldier guarding a truck of supplies. These supplies were given to the mutants in exchange for their help in securing both ends of a nearby tunnel. With this tunnel secured, a Nod MCV was brought in to establish a base at a nearby site that seemed to be the location of a past Nod base. Mutant soldiers from outside the battle space periodically streamed in to assist the Brotherhood. However, once the exact location of the research facility was discovered, the Forgotten realized GDI was actually trying to help them. The mutants immediately turned against the Brotherhood. Nod was able to destroy the research facility, only realizing later that the entire operation was a trap. McNeil and Umagon captured Anton Slavic and Oksana Christos. Although Slavic and Oksana would later be freed, Nod's interactions with the Forgotten from this point on in the campaign would be inconsequential. After the presumed death of Kane, the Brotherhood of Nod was once again splintered. This victory further solidified GDI's alliance with the Forgotten for a short time. Tratos worked directly with GDI's Daedalus science team led by Dr. Boudreau. The team's goal was to find a cure for the mutants and reverse the proliferation of Tiberium, which at this point was threatening to collapse the Earth's natural environment. The, quote, cure that Tratos had given to Umagon had failed, and the divination she was subjected to during her capture had now made her mindless. Tratos needed the Tacitus, as he believed it was the only way to save his people and the Earth. While the Tacitus was being transported aboard the Kodiak, the ship was struck by a lightning bolt during an ion storm, causing it to crash off the coast of Egypt. A recovery team was sent in to find the crash site and retrieve the Tacitus. This team came across a ruined town inhabited by mutants. The town came under attack by a Nod subterranean APC, which the GDI team helped destroy. In return for their help, the mutants directed the GDI team to the Kodiak crash site and warned them of a Nod MCV in the area. The recovery team found the Kodiak, successfully retrieved the Tacitus, and exfiltrated the area. Over on the Nod side of things, Slavic and an unnamed commander successfully got Cabal back up and running, believing the AI could help restore order to the fractured Brotherhood. But Cabal had its own plans, and ordered the unnamed Nod commander to assassinate Tratos, as the mutant leader was the only one who could translate the Tacitus. Tratos resided at a large GDI base, along with a retinue of mutant bodyguards. After shutting down the Firestorm defense barrier that protected Trados, the Nod Strike team was able to infiltrate the perimeter and kill him. Trados' assassination was a devastating blow for both GDI and the Forgotten. Many mutants were angry, not just at the Brotherhood, but at GDI for failing to protect their leader as promised. Mutants located at Colony 3 broke out into a riot, destroying agricultural infrastructure, which threatened to starve the entire colony. An unnamed GDI commander led a team of riot troops and mobile EMP tanks into the colony to quell the riots. There were two mutant riot leaders and two blunt leaders inflaming the riots. The mutants had an advantage over the blunts, using captured bikes, buggies, and wolverines to target vital colony infrastructure. The GDI riot team found the two blunt leaders on the west side of the colony and neutralized them. 
The team then moved to the east side of the colony where the mutants were located, and subdued the mutant leaders as well. The rioting would finally come to an end when a priest came running out of the local town church, employing the populace to cease the violence. Can't we all just get along? While GDI was busy with the riots, a group of mutants ran off with the Tacitus. Cabal needed the Tacitus, and thus ordered a Nod commander to retrieve it. The mutant base was located in a region of heavy Tiberium infestation, with veinhole monsters, floaters, fiends, and a plethora of Tiberian flora. The mutants tried to drive out the Nod intruders, but to no avail. The Nod commander easily eliminated the mutants' outlying checkpoints. However, when moving an attack force through a canyon, it was ambushed and surrounded by mutant warriors. While this attack failed, the Nod commander formed a new one, which succeeded in breaching the mutant base and breaking through its defenses. After the base was leveled, the commander found and retrieved the Tacitus. Unfortunately for Cabal, a missing fragment prevented him from translating the data matrix. As the AI had by now rebelled against the Brotherhood, Cabal would use GDI to retrieve this missing fragment, located inside a temple in Bolivia. The GDI squad sent to recover the fragment was led by a ghost stalker. After fighting their way past the cult that guarded the ancient temple, the squad's archaeologist, Valdez, successfully retrieved the fragment. Once GDI handed over the Tacitus fragment to Cabal, he had no use for them, extending his rebellion to the organization. Cabal needed more humans to fuel his cyborg army, so he targeted civilian colonies, kidnapping the inhabitants, and bringing them to cyborg conversion facilities. Colony 6 was one of Cabal's targets, and a GDI commander was sent to warn the colony of Cabal's impending raid. By the time the commander arrived, the GDI base of the colony was already under assault by Cabal's cyborgs. The commander ran to each civilian village in the region, warning them to prepare defenses. Some mutants lived in one of the three nearby villages. Attention mutants, Cabal is currently harvesting biological components for his cyborgs. Arm yourselves. As thanks for warning them of Cabal's intentions, the mutants gave the GDI commander a harvester to help re-establish military operations and build up a force strong enough to destroy Cabal's nearby cyborg production facility. Only by forming a temporary alliance were GDI and the Brotherhood able to defeat Cabal and bring an end to the Firestorm Crisis. With the complete Tacitus now back in the hands of GDI, the Daedalus research team were able to translate a wealth of data from it. Data that would be used to reverse the effects of Tiberium contamination across the planet. Unfortunately for the Forgotten, none of this data led to a cure that could reverse the effects of their mutations. Even after the initial riots in the wake of Trotus's death were quelled, relations between the Forgotten and GDI never improved. Eventually, in the year 2037, the Forgotten went into a self-imposed exile out into the Tiberium Wastelands. No reports exist on exactly what the mutants were up to out in the Tiberium Wastes, which had now been reclassified as Red Zones by GDI. In 2042, five years after their exile, GDI deployed G-330X habitat modules on the borders of the Red Zones as a good faith gesture. In 2046, it was reported by one Constance Fitchhaven in an Ion and Hollow brief that there were scattered but unconfirmed reports of mutants taking shelter within the habitat modules. The mutants that lived within these hovels became known as mutant marauders. We will not be forgotten! These mutants were very different from the ones encountered during the Second Tiberium War and Firestorm Crisis. They were taller and physically stronger than the average man with green glowing eyes, very little hair, and menacing teeth. Tattoos or paint markings ran all over their body. Their strength enabled them to carry heavy weapons with ease, though their favorite ones were belt-fed miniguns, with the ammunition carried in a backpack. The minigun was excellent at eliminating infantry units and could also destroy light vehicles. The marauders were even capable of using the weapons against aircraft, perhaps due to enhanced vision. The Marauders were most deadly within a Tiberium field, as they could automatically heal wounds and remain hidden within it, ready to ambush unsuspecting harvesters or anyone else foolish or brave enough to wade through the field. A couple of questions that do get raised are whether the mutant Marauders are a physical representation of all the Forgotten, or just a further mutated version of some of them. 
are the Marauders a result of Tiberium's evolution from an organic-based substance to a non-organic proton lattice? I would think that the evolution of Tiberium would have killed off the Forgotten entirely, just like how all other Tiberium-based flora and fauna seem to die off. Then again, Nod managed to infuse their own troops with the new form of liquid Tiberium to make them stronger. Though we don't know the long-term consequences of this infusion. Such as, do the troops eventually die, and their bodies used to fill the ranks of the Marked of Cain? Or perhaps some of these troops find a way out of the Brotherhood, taking shelter in the Red Zones, eventually becoming mutants themselves. There is also a line the mutant marauders say, We are not like the others. The marauders could be referring to just normal humans, but I wonder if it may also refer to other mutants who, while affected by Tiberium, do not look like the marauders, and instead kept the same appearance as those mutants commonly seen during the Second Tiberium War. What the INN Hollow Brief excerpt does not mention is that at some point, a group of militant mutants calling themselves the Sons of Umagon had formed. This group was known to conduct raids on GDI and sometimes even nod outposts. It was also suspected that these mutants were responsible for the destruction of the GDI treasury in 2046. Last night, an unidentified entity broke through our defenses, shut down our power, and triggered an explosive device within the treasury itself. The level of damage inflicted is unknown, but initial estimates indicate that the losses might be in the billions. We have no leads, no suspects although initial evidence gathering has led us to believe that the culprits may be the Sons of Umagon, a militant mutant separatist group, and we have no idea how we are going to explain this to the Council. Of course, the actual culprit behind the Treasury's destruction was the Brotherhood of Nod. Kane wanted to prevent GDI's treasurer, Redmond Boyle, from attending the annual energy summit on the GDSS Philadelphia. This was done so that when Nod destroyed the space station, Boyle would become the new, incompetent director of GDI. The third Tiberium War between the Global Defense Initiative and Brotherhood of Nod largely took place in blue and yellow zones across the planet. Later, after the liquid Tiberium detonation beneath Temple Prime in Sarajevo, the alien Skrin would launch a premature invasion of Earth, making landfall within the red zones. It's unclear exactly how the mutants reacted to the Skrin invasion, but it seemed they didn't appreciate these alien invaders making landfall within what the mutants considered their territory. While Cain was, yet again, presumed dead after the liquid Tiberium detonation, Killian Katar took over the Brotherhood and made an alliance with GDI to fight the Skrin. In Australia, the Skrin were threatening to break through the Sydney city wall, and Nod forces arrived to help GDI drive back the invaders, as well as secretly steal nuclear launch codes from a GDI lab within the city. Just north of the Nod base, at the beginning of the operation, a couple squads of mutant marauders can be seen fighting against the Skrin. These squads would be cut down, but this incident is proof that the mutants also resisted the alien invaders. When Kane resurfaced, making it clear to all in the Brotherhood that he was still in command, he vowed that Killian would pay for her betrayal in joining forces with GDI. When Kane's loyal forces arrived at Killian's headquarters at Ayers Rock, the base was surrounded by marauders. These mutants were hostile to anyone that came near them, having taken control of many strategic assets in the region, including a couple of Tiberium spikes and some Tiberium silos. The Nod commander eliminated the mutants guarding a nearby hovel. A saboteur then contacted the mutants inside, convincing some of them to aid the Nod commander. The rest of the neutral mutants were taken out, so the commander could utilize the Tiberium spikes and silos. The mutants that were recruited from the hovel helped the commander destroy Killian's forces, leading to her capture and execution. The Brotherhood of Nod weren't the only ones who would contact the mutant marauders and pay for their services. GDI would also make use of them if they felt the mutants could help contribute during a battle. Sometimes the mutants were allowed to ride in APCs or hammerhead gunships. Mutant marauders could even receive medical aid from a GDI armory. Skrin assimilators could capture a mutant hovel and recruit from it, though I think this is just a function of gameplay, since, as stated earlier, the mutants fought against the Skrin outside the behests of either GDI or Nod. While the Skrin brought devastation upon Earth in the latter part of the Third Tiberium War, the Global Defense Initiative was able to rally their forces and defeat the alien invaders. Of the 19 threshold towers the aliens built, only one remained, captured by the Brotherhood of Nod. 
Though the Third Tiberium War was now over, with both Nod and GDI having suffered greatly from it, one question that remains is how many of the Forgotten survived. With the Skrin having made landfall in the Red Zones, and being completely hostile to indigenous life on Earth, one can assume the Forgotten would have been hit hard by the invaders. However, due to living in the Red Zones, the Forgotten could have also been the best at resisting the Skrin, perhaps using guerrilla warfare tactics against the invaders, just as they had against GDI and Nod for years before. As Tiberium continues to proliferate the Earth, it will only become more difficult for normal humans to survive. Unless GDI can effectively reverse the spread of Tiberium, or the Brotherhood can create better means of controlling and harnessing its great potential, the Forgotten may become the true inheritors of a Tiberian Earth, so long as the Skrin do not return to finish what they started.